All right, today we're going to cover elevations, exterior, and a couple of your interior, which we're just going to cover cabinet elevations. Basically, what we're going to cover today is in page 567 in your book, all the way through 628 in your book. I'm not going to cover it all, I'll allow you to read some of it, but I'm going to talk about it. How do you figure up or how do you produce elevations from what you've already drawn? Six twenty. Well, basically through six twenty-five. Five, five sixty-seven to six twenty-five. All right. This is actually two very good chapters. Um, you're going to want to read over it so you can see how to represent certain things. But let's just discuss what you actually show on elevation. I'm going to come over to Canvas to the assignment folder that you have or that I've placed out there called elevations. Under that assignment folder should be two files, elevation one and elevation two. I'm going to open Elevation 1 and let's talk about it. Alright, as you can see I have a front and right side elevation. When you're trying to consider or decide which one's the right, which one's the left side, basically think of it like this. If you're standing outside looking at the front of the house, wherever your right hand is, that's the right side of the house. So you walk around there, when you're looking at the right hand where the right hand side that'd be your right side elevation. Now the things you want to show on an elevation are the materials of the outside. Okay, whatever that is going to be. Is that brick? Is that hardy plank, vinyl siding, stucco, um, anything like that? If there's an exposed slab or exposed chain wall like we have on this uh, floor plan or on this drawing or set of drawings that we've been working on, then you'll show where the exposed CMU goes. Okay? You're going to want to show what the windows look like, what the doors look like. So you need to have a general idea of what your client is looking for as far as their look, because you're going to want to represent it just like you're called out. You're probably sitting here wondering, well, where do I find this information when well, you should have already drawn it? You remember your door and window schedule? You need to go to that door and window schedule, match it up to what you have on there to your elevation. Um, of course, your header height on all doors and windows are generally six foot eight. So when you go to draw your elevation, you'll show your top of your windows at six foot eight and your top of your door. The only place where it wouldn't actually be six foot eight off the slab would be the garage. Okay. Why would, a, why would it not be six foot eight off the slab in the garage? Because your garage slab does drop down supposedly four inches. Okay? But when we actually build it out in the field, we only actually drop it down three and a half because that's what a two by four is, three and a half inches. So when you go to draw, let's, this one does, this plan, plan does not have it, but if you go to draw an elevation of a house with a garage, basically all you'll do is bring a line straight across your six foot eight height on the main slab. Just draw it straight across and that's where your header height is for your garage door. And your win, garage window and all that kind of stuff. Okay? It, it's not necessarily quote unquote six foot eight in the garage, but it lines up with the rest of the house windows. Okay. 
So you want to draw a true representation of what your windows and doors are going to look like. If your entry door, main entry door of the house is going to have a transom, which is like a window above the door, or side lights, which are like the little windows that's on the side of the door connected, you need to show that. If your windows are going to have trim around it, for instance, like uh, the hardy plank or siding, some people put the three, four inch trim around the windows just to give it a look. Uh, a lot of people that do stucco on the exterior of the house also does like a four or five inch trim around it, stuccoed, just to give it a, a, a specific look that they're looking for. Okay. You need to show all window. Um, I'm sorry, not windows, but all doors, all stairs, all handrails, and I see a error on. The stairs on the front and side of elevation, it's missing the handrails for some reason. And I'll go check that out. But you see the handrails that are on this right side and front elevation going across, those should also be going down the stairs too. Now, here's the key to the spacing of the handrails. They should be five inches on center between the handrails, okay? Center to center of the handrail. When I'm talking about the handrail, let me zoom into this real quick. Each one of these spindles should be five inches from center to center. Typically how we lay this out is you find the center of your handrail of the board of the member going across you find the center of it that's where the center of your first spindle should be and then it's five inches on center from there now this typical floor plan or elevation is drawn with one inch by one inch um, members okay it's just one inch by one inch I guess you'd say treated wood. Okay, so it's one and one by one. Actually, I lied. This is two by two. This is actually these member these spindles are actually two by two treated members. Okay. Now. These handrails are drawn with the top member is just a 2 by 4 The bottom member is a 2 by 4 And what it is, is the 2 by 4 is laying where it's 4 inches, where you can see the 4 inch part of the 2 by 4, okay? The bottom 2x4 is sitting up off the top of the slab one, one and a half inches. Okay, this bottom 2x4 is sitting off the slab one and a half inches. Basically, what we do is when we build these handrails, okay, when you build them, you lay a 2x4 flat with the 4 inches down on the slab on the top and bottom. You basically mark where your center 2x2 two two is going to go on the two 2x4s two and then you mark your 5 inches on center from there on out. Then what we do is once we nail all the spindles on we pick the whole handrail up and we go set it up to where it's supposed to go and then we slide a 2x4 underneath the handrail at each end with the 4 inch laying on the slab. That's how you get the one and a half inches. Okay. So you try to represent it the same exact way. I'm going to expect when you draw this out, just like I have, your handrails or your spindles, where they're shown, everything should be trimmed out behind them, just like I have. Okay, you really can't see it on here, but it is trimmed out. Where You want to show a true representation of what it's going to look like if you're standing out here looking at the front. 
So you should not have lines going through your spindles. The same thing goes for the handrails on the stairs. Like I said, there should be hand uh, spindles in between these two by fours. But the same thing goes. It should be a half inch or one and a half inch off the top of the stair is how much these handrails are sitting down on. It is five inches straight across. So basically draw your real long line and I'll set it five and just trim it from there. Yeah, it's still gotta be five inches. And why? Why anybody have a clue why I'm saying five inches? A kid, so a kid cannot get their head through the spindles. Okay. And we and here's the reason why. If you can get your head through it, a kid can get his head and his body through it. And if that's the case, it's doing you no good to have them up there. A kid can fall through and get killed. All right. So this is on stairs on the outside, stairs on the inside. If I'm not mistaken, it's anything over two foot six. I think it's over two foot six or two foot. I think it's in the chapter that tells you anything over that height has to have handrails. Yeah, I think it's two foot six. So anything over 30 inches has to have handrails. Now, how do you lay this out? This is what I typically do. I grab my floor plan minus the dimensions. Okay, I'll, I'll grab my floor plan and I'll copy it over to the side. Then what I do is just start projecting everything down. Okay. I go grab the left hand side, I project it down. I grab the right hand side, I project it down. Then I'll go and grab maybe let's say just the left hand side of each window and door and I'll project it down. Okay. Then I'll draw me a horizontal line to represent the ground. And then I just start working up from there. I'll start working from the ground, however far up the slab should go. I'll draw me a line. Wherever the slab is, Generally, there's got to be the bottom of the door. All set six foot eight from there. That should be your header height. Okay. And so on and so on. So easier with the uh, wall section there. Wall. Yes. Okay. But here's what I typically do. I, I kind of kill two birds with one, spo one stone when I'm drawing an elevation. I actually create a wall section of the house. Okay? And that's why I actually went out under modules, underneath elevations, I actually put you three files roof detail, roof detail porch, timber pile detail. I'm going to open up the roof detail real quick. I get it to open here. All right, and when you open the roof detail, you will see if you create, this is your rafter. Okay, you have a rafter sitting there on top of your wall. Your rafter has to be at whatever slope your roof is at. Your elevation is going to show that. That's something you're going to have to tell on the elevation. On my drawing, I actually tell you that this house is a 6 on 12 slope. Okay? So you'll have to draw this. How you do that is just draw a line straight up 6, straight over 12, connect the ends, and that tells you what the slope of the roof is. Generally, a rafter is a 2 by 6. Okay? Since a rafter is a 2 by 6, if you offset that angle 5 and a quarter, I mean five and a half, that gives you that rafter. 
If you go back and look at my elevation, it tells you what the overhang of the roof is. The new code since Hurricane Katrina states that you're not supposed to have an overhang greater than one foot. Cannot, and it's not supposed to be greater than one foot. Which means, if you're using hardy plank, or vinyl siding, or stucco, anything like that, you'll go from the face of your stud wall there, one foot out, and that's where the end of your overhang is. Okay? If you're using brick, that's a different story. If you're using brick wall, because of the air gap and where the brick is and all that, gen the general idea is if you go one foot six from the face of the stud wall, then that leaves you right at a foot. It's actually one foot zero and one half of an inch. But that's okay with that half an inch. Okay? So if you're using brick, you'd go over one foot six from the stud wall. If you're using stucco or vinyl siding or hardy plank, you'll go over one foot from the stud wall. All right, this roof detail that I've given you, this is actually on top of this rafter is, um, as you can see, it's metal roofing. Okay. This house that we're doing currently, if you pay attention to your elevation, is actually architectural shingles. So instead of drawing these two by four strips here, which I didn't even call out, in the metal roofing, you would actually have plywood, felt, then asphalt shingles. So you would have plywood on top of the rafter, felt on top of the plywood, and asphalt shingles on top of that. You see where this vinyl soffit and this 2x4 blocking is on this roof detail? You will know where the bottom of this is by based off of where your bottom of your rafter comes out and hits your one foot overhang. Where your rafter hits your one foot overhang is where the bottom of that 2x4 block going back to the wall will be. Okay. So this is a this is basically a typical detail at the edges of your roof. Okay. I'm gonna open what a roof detail may look like at a porch. And this is another file I already have out there. Oh, what happened there? Okay, you see it's basically the same thing. Notice, you couldn't see it real well on that other one, but notice on this rafter how there is a bird's mouth. Okay, that is called a bird's mouth. Basically, how how do you know where your how far your rafter comes down to sit on this? This is how you'll do it. When you draw your rafter and you all set the top line down five and a half, you will sit the bottom of that rafter on the corner of your wall here or in this case it's the flitch beam okay what you will do is you will draw a line over three and a half inches okay from the corner of that flitch beam you will draw or the corner of your wall you'll draw a line three and a half inches over then you will draw the line straight up. Then what you do is you grab the rafter from where the line that you just drew straight up hits it. 
you will move it down from that point down to the top of the wall or in this instance the top of the flitch beam and then you just cut out when you're actually out in the field you're not going to see that half inch gap there it's just drawn for clarity to show you what's going on okay but that gives you how far down the rafter has to be cut down to go sit on top of your wall or your flitch beam you don't just stick a rafter out there with the angle just sitting on the wall it has to have some type of seat you have to have that connectability to be able to screw down or nail down to the wall okay and you see that very clearly on this detail at porch in this case you will see this is does have a composite column your plan or your elevation and, and floor plan does have a composite column Notice that in the center of the composite column, and this doesn't show it, but it shows a two inch wide strap anchored to the concrete and flitch beam. This two inch strap that's shown in here should be hidden because you, you can't actually see it. In this case, it didn't come out as a hidden line because I just went out in my model space, printed this out, and it's not from my paper space. So this should be hidden inside there. This is an actual two inch galvanized strap that you literally bolt down to the concrete. So basically before you anchor or before you get your composite column in place, you gotta have to get, have the composite column tilted a little bit. You run the strap up through it, anchor it to the concrete, set your composite column in place, and the strap will come out of the top and you will anchor it down to the bottom of the flitch beam. So basically what you're doing is con or you're anchoring your roof down to your slab. It's only one strap. It's only one strap. And it's got to be in every column. Every composite column. Is the composite columns load bearing? Yes. Inside? Yes, composite columns are load bearing. They're hollow in the inside. But they're pretty thick through so yes these are, they are hollow load bearing columns um any questions about what you see here uh yeah the one to the overhang does that include the one inch fascia oh the one by six fascia right here yeah um You can come out one foot. See, in this case, it would be one foot from this flitch beam. Yeah, it will be to the inside face of the fascia, and then your fascia will go on the outside. So basically what you have there is you have one foot and a half. Okay, a half inch. Or one foot three quarters of an inch. All right, any other questions on this? Another detail I threw out there just for you to have in case we do one like this. This is, okay, it's a timber pile detail. If you were sitting, a house was sitting on top of piles, okay, and these were treated piles, let's say 6 by 6, 8 by 8, 10 by 10, 12 by 12, really doesn't matter. Notice how all this is set up. On top of the pile, notice that your flitch beams are notched into the pile. Where your flitch beam is actually sitting on part of the pile. It doesn't just sit on the top. You actually notch the top of the pile out or not the top of the timber out on both sides. And your flitch beam goes in and sits on the seat that you've created. Then you bolt the flitch beams onto the pole okay using um, one inch high strength bolts that goes all the way through and you can see um, notice that you drew this kind of on the foundation plan I think 
where I told you there were some uh, joist hangers on each end of the 2x12 joist that was on your foundation. This is what they actually look like. Um, you would have a hurricane strap would have to go the length from the timber pile all the way across the flitch beam all the way up to your stud wall. You see it calls it out right there. So this gives you an example of what you would see if you're on top of a timber pile. All right. Now back to elevate our elevation. As you can see, this is a gable. Okay? This is what we consider a gable roof. Notice over here to the right, I drew what if you were standing on top of the roof or about 10 feet above the roof, what it would look like by looking down on it. A gable roof is very simple. It has two slopes and it runs the full length of the house. If you're going to do this as a hip, it's a little more complicated. Okay? You want to, might want to make this note in case you have to do a hip, and you're definitely going to want to look at a hip roof in this chapter. If you're doing a house with a hip roof, you will have to have a 45 degree line that goes from every corner of the exterior wall. You will have to have a 45 degree line that goes through every corner of the exterior wall. And a good example of what I'm talking about, let's see if I can find one here. Look on page 568 in your book. 568 in your book, the top right image, <clears throat> the top right image is a combination of a hip and a gable running in each other. Okay, so the top 568 is a hip and a gable, a hip on the top right, there's two images, the one on the left the gable is on the front right side, the, um, the hip is on the left side. Y'all see the difference? Okay, the gable basically just has three lines on it. All three lines are going vertical. The hip has two 45 degree lines and where the 45 degree lines meet, then you have a line that leads from that point going the opposite direction. So if you're doing a hip plan, every corner has to have a 45 degree angle. That's looking, from the top, right? That's looking at it from the top. Page 568, those two are looking at it from the top. And you see they're projecting it off of the elevations. They are projecting this off the elevations. Now, what I was getting at before is once you draw that roof detail that I had out had up a minute ago, once you draw that, that basically then tells you where all of this. Let me get in. You see where on this front elevation it says top of wall? It shows you how to create all of this. It's this rafter or this fascia right here, or uh, eave right here, this is five and a uh, half inches. Okay, because when, you, when you're drawing a house with a gable end, a house with a gable end, when I mean gable end, that's the end of the house where you see the V. Okay, the end of the house where you see the V on the roof. That extends out two feet. 
That extends out two feet from the end of the house. Okay, it extends out two feet from the end of the house. But once you get your section drawn, that should help you with your elevations. It kind of gives you, um, if you look right here on the right side elevation, where the roof comes down and basically is right above your window, that little gap right there or that little um, blank spot, you will get that distance from your section that you draw. Remember that one by six fascia that um, Alex just asked me about? I just had a brain fart, man. That one by six fascia that Alex asked me about on that detail, that tells you what that height is that you're going to show right here on this elevation. That's right above this column on this right side elevation. Okay, You'll get all that information off that section. Two feet on each end. Now, you see this little, and I did this on purpose. You won't show this uh, line that's above the column here on the right side elevation. You won't show that as a phantom line. I did it on purpose just so you can recognize this. That line is the actual bottom of that flitch beam that you saw on that one detail. The one that had the composite column on it. Okay. The reason you see this okay the reason that you see the bottom of this flitch beam is for your roof that's coming over the flitch beam for it to fall out with the eave the same all the way across the top of your flitch beam has to be in line with the top of your wall. That way when your rafter falls on top of your wall, then your when your rafter falls on the top of that flitch beam, it's in, in line with each other. So you will see part of your flitch beam on the front porch. So when you draw this elevation, do not have that as a phantom line. Have it as a continuous line. I did it as a phantom line just so you could see the difference. See what I was talking about. You can understand what I'm talking about there? All right, how do you figure out the stair height on these? You already know what the height of the CMU wall was, correct? Because we already drew the sections of those. You basically take the height from the ground to the slab, or the top of the 2x12 joist that's on the main slab, or the main part of the house, which was, I think we had it, what, we said 3 foot, I think it was like three foot was the top of the wall. Then you had 11 and a quarter was the joy sitting on top. Am I correct on that? All right. So you have three foot, 11 and a quarter from the ground up to basically the top of your joist. You take that height and divide by seven inch and th seven and three quarters of an inch. Okay, so let's say it's 3 foot 11, you divide it by 7 and 3 quarter of an inch. I don't know what that number is going to come up to. But let's just say it comes up to 4 point something. You got to round it up to the next 
whole number. So if it's four point something, it'll come up to five. What five is, is how many treads, which means how many horizontal steps that you have to show. But here's the key. The fifth horizontal step is always the top of the floor or the top of the slab. Now, why do I use seven and three quarters of an inch? Is because that is the maximum height a riser can be on a stair. You cannot go taller than seven and three quarters of an inch. Why? Because seven and three quarters of an inch basically is a natural step when you climb in a set of stairs. You get any higher, it trips people. So no matter what the number is, the last step always is slab. Yep. The last step is always your slab or the top of like your two by twelve joints. Okay, now some people don't do it that way. Some people actually do where their last tread when they build their stairs, they figure it all the way up and it's level with the slab and stuff. We don't do it that way. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Seven and three quarters is the maximum riser a stair can have. Now your tread, which is the horizontal part, the part you step on, you can have Here's the sizes that you can make it. 10, 11, or 12 inches. 10, 11, or 12 inches. Okay. 10 is minimum, of course. 12 is maximum. Common is 11. Same thing. You get over 12 inches on a step, people trip. Where their foot doesn't go on the next step all the way and they'll sprain an ankle or something. Okay? You get below 10 inches on a tread, then your foot, it's not enough of your foot is actually on the tread. Okay? So that's kind of what they go by. It's all trip hazard is the reason. Alright. So elevation We've talked about all the things you should show, columns, handrails, windows, doors, the sidings, the roof materials. You need to show the slope of the roof, which you can see I have on the front elevation here, 6 on 12 right there. That's telling you the slope of the roof. The hexagonal vent, you have to have those. It doesn't have to be hexagonal. On all houses, you can they got rectangular and so forth. But generally they're there to air out your attic. Your attic has to have airflow go through it. Okay? Why is that important? If it gets too hot up there, you get a lot of condensation. If you have no airflow to Breathe, breathe the air out. You start getting condensation build up, which starts molding, starts rotting, and so forth. Okay? So you have to have airflow. And another thing it does is if it's, your attic is way too hot, your house gets too hot. Because cold or hot air rises from your floor up to your ceiling. Okay? So if everything's too hot up in your attic and it's not getting enough airflow, then it, your air conditioner reads that and it starts wanting to over overcool your house. Underneath, when you saw that roof detail I showed you a minute ago, nailed up under that 2x4 block, it said soffit, vinyl soffit. A lot of times what they'll do on the vinyl soffit and, and go look at a house that has vinyl soffit on it. You'll notice about every fourth piece of vinyl soffit has holes in it. It's called perforated. Okay? 
That's another thing that they do to allow the hot air to escape out of those perforated soffits. So you'll see there'll be three solid pieces of vinyl, and then the next one will be perforated. They'll have holes in it. Then you'll have three. Then a, that's to also to help allow your vinyl soffit or your attic to breathe. Would you use like full red red vents? Some people do. Yeah. Or oh, well, a house, the top. Well, your roof will have a ridge vent, but it doesn't go across the entire roof. It only goes, yeah, it's like five, I think they're about 10 foot pieces, I think. So generally, if you can get a 10 foot piece up there, you're pretty good. Spinner things in my house, and then the hurricane get there from trash bag on top. Yeah. We don't put those, we put a ridge vent that actually nails on top of the roof and then you put your shingles basically over the top of it. Um, so yes, your attic does have to have um, parts of it to breathe. Um, that one you can just go out and Google it. That hexagonal vent right there. Just Google it; it'll tell you about the basic sizes of it. All right. Generally, I like to call out a few measurements to show them where basically the floor slab is, the height of the wall. Just trying to give them a. Um, an, Something to go off of to see what the heights of this stuff is to try to proportion it out. So I just give them a few. They should have most of the information off of your notes already and off your foundation details. Um, I do, now not everybody does this. I give, and a lot of people tell me don't do this, but I sometimes give a dimension of about what the rafter, approximate length of a rafter is going to be. So you know about what to order. A lot of people don't do that because they want the contractor to figure that out so that, I don't know. Less work for you. I do it just to give an owner that's ordering material or a building company that's doing it, I give them a dimension just to give them an approximation of what the rafter length is going to be. So they know, since that's 17 foot, 10, 11, 16, they can either order an 18 or a 20 foot rafter. I'd personally probably order the 20 foot. When you're that close, 17 foot, 10 and something, you're only an inch away from the length of the board. You want to give another foot. Why? Just in case you mess up that end cut, that you have enough room to cut it again. If you try to order too precise, then you're going to be reordering a board off of a messed cut, messed, messed up cut. All right, but to get the elevations, like I said, you're just going to do a lot of projecting. That's all you're going to do, projecting off your floor plan. What I do a lot of times is copy my floor plan four times or have four floor plans out there and I'll just rotate the floor plan each image to what side I'm doing and I'll start projecting because what I like to do is do all four elevations at the same time what I'll do is I get everything on each elevation when I start plopping my windows in there I just go across all four elevations plopping in my windows especially if you have some that are exactly the same so it just kind of helps you knock out all of them at one time instead of trying to draw one, then go out, try to draw it. If you do them all at the same time, it makes it a lot easier. If you notice, that's the front elevation, the right side elevation. This house was identical almost both sides, right? So all you have to do is once you draw the front and right is mirror it and maybe add a little bit more detail. That's why when you're looking at this stuff, at first it seems like a lot, but all this is is a lot of copy and paste mirror. 
When you're drawing your section in your roof, once you draw one side of your roof, if you mirror it right from the middle, that gives you your right side of your roof and you just fill it the connection. So this is just a lot of copy and mirrors, all it is. Copy, mirror, and project. You're just trying to give a true representation of what this house is going to look like to your client. That's all you're trying to do. Um, I would definitely read all these chapters because they show you, because not just for this class, but maybe even for future. I would personally even maybe go to somewhere like to uh, Staples or something and to actually get them to copy every one of these pages for you because if you plan on doing house plans in the future you will re re revisit this section I think a hundred and something bucks now when it comes to drawing for example a bay window you still got to draw it the same way now overhangs might change but to be able to draw, I'm talking about more to draw. I ain't worried about code. To draw a hip roof is always going to be the same. It's always got to have 45 degree lines everywhere. A lot of people when they're drawing a hip roof, they make the mistake and try to draw their own angles. Every corner of a hip roof, if it's a completely hip roof, it always has to be a 45 degree angle. Okay? So that's where a lot of people make a mistake. I, I watched last year, Miss McGee had them drawing a house, and a lot of people were trying to make their own angles at the corners, and you can't do that. Okay, when you're drawing it on a roof plan, it has to be at a 45. All right, um, so I would, especially if you look. Um, 599 shows you a good example of how they project and, and come up with a roof and all that kind of stuff. 599 shows you how to project a bay window. I don't know. I don't even know if they'll do it because it's copyright issues. But well, if you got a printer at home, you scan yourself. So or run to the library and pay ten cents a page and scan it. They need calling like fifty dollars. Wow. You can go to the library and do it ten cents a page yourself. You look anything you want to up on Google. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was a hundred, about a hundred pages. Bay window. Less than a hundred pages. Yeah, I'm gonna have to do this stuff tomorrow. Here, in a few minutes, why? Well, this class is one to seven. I'll keep you till seven. Yeah. There's a free way to do it. All right. The cabinet elevations. All I'm going to tell you about that. The cabinet elevations. There are three of them you got to draw. You're basically going to draw, if you remember on your floor plan, you do, drew the two triangles in the kitchen. Some of you did, some of you didn't. <laughs> the triangles were because you're going to draw the elevations of those views. If you click on the two cabinet elevations I give you, the two sheets, it shows you number one, number two, and number three, because there were three different triangles you did. All you're doing is basically showing the cabinet maker, this is the type of cabinet I want. Okay, I'm, I'll go ahead and open it up because I do want to tell you some, one thing about it. Oh, yes, sir. 
You look here. Huh? What? You said excellent. Were you, were you mocking my drawing here? Okay. You see these hidden lines on the cabinet doors? That is showing you the swing of the door. The point where the two lines come together basically is telling them where to put the knobs. Put it on this side so I can open the door and basically you're telling it which way to swing. Okay. So in this case, the knob will be here. You'll open the door and it'll open toward that window. Okay. Same, this drawer right here, you notice it has one too. This is basically telling them, I want this drawer right here to open. I want it to pull down. Yeah, it's a pull down. It's not a pull out. It's a, it's a, oh, I use mine. I keep my sponges for my dishwashing. I keep my sponges in there. Yeah. Okay, notice I showed the window that's in there. Notice I showed the pantry door that was in there. Okay, the fridge, dishwasher, any appliances that you will see. This hatch lines are just basically showing the ends of the cabinet. I'm looking at the ends of a cabinet there. It's just to distinguish between what you're seeing face on and what you're seeing from the side. These right here, just Google them. I think they're like um, half an inch or so. Depends on what your cabinet guy is going to use. Is he, is he using half inch material? Is he using three quarter inch material? Okay. These cabinets were custom built. The guy gave me exactly what he wanted. Look in the book. For example, 615 kind of shows you how all this works. Okay? Page 615, 614, 613. All that whole chapter shows you a lot of what you're measuring. Like I said, mine might be a little different from what the book shows, and it's strictly because. This guy wanted custom. This is what he wanted. I gave him what he wanted. So we ain't got to have him quite well. Doesn't look like there's a bare minimum. Well, a lot of what the book shows is standard. This is generally what all cabinets are going to come. Unless you got somebody who wants some custom. For example, Um, for example, uh, if you look at 615 at the top, it's showing you the bottom cabinet or the base cabinet is about 36 inches. That is true. That's generally what it is. Um, Top cabinets are generally 30 inches tall, unless it's over like a fridge or you got a microwave that you got a cabinet over. It shows you if you had a bar, um, so forth, so forth. All right. You're going to show, just like I have it, if there's a faucet supposed to be there, you're going to show the faucet. Okay? Dishwasher, show the dishwasher. Huh? I mean, if you want to show a different looking refrigerator where it's got the double doors for the fridge on top and the freezer on the bottom, that's fine. If you want to show... Because <laughs> they don't have the bubble water. 
didn't count at all. All right, you see in the bathroom, I showed them I wanted, I want an actual cabinet style sink, not a pedestal. I want a cabinet style. Okay, notice I actually left the, I don't know how, but I left the lines off there too. They're fake doors. They shouldn't be, but. Okay. He said, if you leave him off, you count off. <laughs> <laughs> he said, exactly. That's kind of what I'm saying. Time. Well, actually, I ran in there. Well, I was in there a minute ago. I ran in there and drew this. <laughs> you can have one that's just millwork and one that's appliances. So basically two layers for that. And then, of course, one for dimensions. And generally, if you're going to have a microwave event, you want to tell them that that has the vent underneath. Okay. Why is that important? Because if you're going to have a microwave, um, so that when they buy it, you can buy them. And, and this tell, if you're going to have a microwave up like this, you got to have a plug up there too somewhere. So you got to remember that for an electrical plan, which we'll get to that next week. <laughs> All right. You just kind of wing your faucets. Actually, I went out and got one out of design center. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we can use design center, guys. Okay, and you see at the bottom that says five inches? That is the toe area. Which, if you look on page 615 and all of those cabinets from the sides, notice that they have those missing pieces of the cabinet under there. That's for your toe or your feet to sit up under when you're washing dishes and stuff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I ain't never liked the toe spot because I'll always be sweeping my grandma's kitchen and it's always a pain just trying to sweep up on the All right. <laughs> so. This is what you will draw. The elevation and the cabinet details are both due next week. Monday. Monday. Next week. Front, right, left, rear, and the three cabinet elevations are all due Monday. Yep, just like you see on there. What about the roof section? No, the roof, you won't turn the roof section in, but you draw it to, to help yourself. Okay. We're not going to get to those elevations. I'm not going to make y'all draw or turn them in. Um, but you will have to on your final set. Might as well draw now. Yeah. So that's the 11. Yes. Next week, we will lecture on electrical plan. And um, mechanical plan. Y'all are going to get lucky. I'm not going to make y'all draw it on this set. I'm going to give you, though, the representation of what it would look like with this floor plan. Because next week, I think it's next week. Hold on. All right, I lied. You will draw the electrical plan. Because, because on the 18th, I don't know why I was thinking today was the 11th. The 18th, I will give you your final project. <laughs> Actually, let me see. Hold on. When, when's the final? Let's see. All right, I lied. Okay, next week I will give you the final project. So we won't do the electrical plan, but I will give it to you. Because I wanted you to have at least three weeks to turn it in. All right, that means your final or your, your, pro, your final project in here will be due. 
on Thursday, December 12th. So you have three weeks and three days to do it. Huh? I will lecture next week on electrical and mechanical so you'll know how to do the final project. No. After I lecture next week, that will be the last time that you actually have to be here until December 12th. December 12th. Just for this class. Just for this class. Yeah. Your final exam is your final project. Remember, the final project, I'm not giving you what everything looks like. Yeah, you gotta figure it the out. only thing I will give you is the floor plan with the dimensions and notes and the door schedule, of course. I will describe what I want the foundation to be. I will give you two elevations and you will have to produce the other two. And, F, and, and you will have to produce the electrical plan and the mechanical plan without me giving you anything. You will have to produce the foundation and the details without me giving you anything. You will have to produce the cabinets without me giving you anything. Can you see the reference? Yes. It's really pretty. <laughs> okay. Uh, you will have the floor plan. Mm -hmm. I will give you the floor plan, but the floor plan will not consist of every one of the dimensions I'm gonna give you like if you were to get it off of online where they just give you the room sizes and you got to be able to figure out everything else so that means when you go to dimension it you won't have my floor plan to sit there and cross out every dimension that's supposed to be on there you will have to dimension it like if you're giving it to me to build. I'll know what the dimension should be sitting there. We'll see if you can come up with it. I think we should just, you should make the draw one and then give everybody in the class a different piece of it and see if we can use teamwork. Oh, no. <laughs> so you'll have three and a half weeks to come up with the full set. I will give you a paper that shows you what pages I expect out of the set basically the page number also so I will give you the title block and you will be responsible for giving me a set a full set of construction documents that's right Okay. Everybody clear? Yep. These two are due Monday, the cabinet elevations and the exterior elevations. And I may throw in a curveball in the final. Yeah, I'm saying better win. Well, I don't tell him. They don't win, and he, he throws us some work. Everybody clear on what, what's due? I will lecture next week. Okay? I will be very tired next week. If the Saints win, no So let me put it to you like this next week. I, do, I am going to lecture, and I am going to give you your final. When I get in here, everybody just be better better be ready to listen because I'm gonna be a grumpy dude. I won't get home till one o'clock Monday morning, and I will be here at eight thirty. I'll be your personal driver. I'm gonna get all the rest of me. Just drive back here. Driving in the wrong direction. Okay. I will still only have four and a half hours of sleep.
okay? But you don't understand, I don't sleep during the weekend at all because I'm always up. So usually Monday nights I try to go to bed early. I mean Sunday nights. So... All right. Any questions? All right. You are free to go.